Okay, so good evening, everyone, and welcome to a part one lecture of uh, That's Absurd, Jacques Martin, and Early 20th Century Avant-Garde Art. My name is Godeme, and on behalf of St. Luke's Club, um, I want to thank each of you for tuning in today to have a great intellectual evening. Some of you may wonder, what is St. Luke's Club? So let me introduce ourselves. St. Luke's Club is a community of religious artists uniting Vilnius Academy of Arts and Lithuanian Academy of Music and Theater students who want to deepen their knowledge in philosophy, theology, and art, strengthen mutual relations, and promote cooperation with artists from other disciplines. The aim of the club is to encourage the young creator to take an interest deepen his knowledge and share his work. We delve into core questions regarding our vocation, which include what is the purpose of a creator in today's world and how to achieve it, how to spread it. These issues are central to the activities of our club and we analyze them during meetings with artists in their workshops and conversations in public spaces, uh, topical meetings with theologians and philosophers, which is exact, exactly what we have gathered here today for. I'm very honored to present you today our speaker, who is Professor Stephen Garris, joining us all the way from the United States. Professor Garrett recently taught as an associate professor of philosophy and religion at the Vilnius Academy of Arts. He now serves as cur curriculum vice president for global scholars where he leads an international team of 46 academics from 27 countries to develop resources and curriculum that equip, empower, and encourage Christian academics to bring their Christian faith to bear organically into their teaching, research, and administration. He has published on the theological aesthetics of Hans Urs von Balthasar and continues to explore the nexus of theology and the political via aesthetics in his current research into the late modern philosoph philosophy of art and 20th century personalism. Today and tomorrow, uh, this lecture will, will take place for up to 45 minutes, after which we will have an open discussion. So during the lecture, please write your questions, uh, please write down your questions, which may rise and you will be able to ask them um, yourself during the discussion time or write them in the chat. So thank you for your patience and Professor, you may take over. Thanks uh, for the invitation for a lovely introduction. It's uh, a little uh, strange these days that we have these conversations uh, uh, all over the world like this now um what uh, used to not be so common is now becoming more and more common uh, and so it's great though to reconnect uh, um, with students you know from uh, um, Vilnius uh, as uh, uh, Goldrum had mentioned you know I had uh, worked there at the Art Academy uh, for some time it's been all oh, I think four or five years now uh, but it's a delight to be back and able to discuss some of these topics that um, not only uh, you are interested in exploring philosophically and theologically, these are also very much close to my own heart, um, as uh, this is where my my research uh, and teaching have been for for some time now. So again, thank you for the opportunity. And uh, I don't know if we'll get to 45 minutes, we'll see how how long it goes. Uh, but hopefully that might give us uh, time for a longer conversation. And that's really what I see today as, as a conversation. Um, I don't know that I have all answers. Um, and in fact, I think it's it's really good if we can talk through, you know, some of these ideas uh, as we talk about today in this part one lecture about Jacques Martin uh, and his understanding of the philosophy of art, particularly through his work uh, art and Scholasticism, uh, written in uh, 1920. And so I would encourage you, if you haven't um, seen that work or, uh, or don't know about it, 
that you would uh, find a way to to get a copy of it because it's an important work um, that was uh, uh, written in the early 20th century. So I'm going to share my screen here and uh, begin to my presentation and just make sure that uh, everybody can see it. So. Can everybody see the screen? Yeah, or the, yeah. the slides, yes. yeah? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, the title of today's uh, presentation is That's Absurd, Jacques Maritain, and Early 20th Century uh, Avant-Garde Art. So Jacques Maritain um, was uh, born in Paris uh, to a prominent lawyer named Paul Maritain and uh, his mother, Genevieve Favre, uh, the daughter of a French statesman. Uh, and the family was superficially Protestant. Some would characterize them as uh, uh, liberal Protestants, um, meaning not politically liberal, um, but in, in the not, not as the traditional Protestant uh, forms, um, not conservative, but on the more liberal side of the spectrum of Protestantism at the time. The family was well connected uh, and with the, uh, the secular anti-clerical French Third Republic government, which was in existence up until uh, World War II, uh, when the Vichy government uh, took over. So it uh, was also um, prominent with ideas of humanity and making progress. This had to do with the, the spirit and the age of the day uh, about uh, scientific uh, progress. And so um, this was running in and through uh, their family uh, as they were, as, as I mentioned, uh, connected quite well with the French Third Republic government. But uh, Mer Jacques Maritain was, was really not very happy about this. He was uh, dissatisfied. In fact, he saw it uh, as bourgeois, uh, and he reacted in such a way that he didn't think that this sort of scientific or scientism was uh, uh, the kind of progress um, that would ensure progress. In fact, he thought socialism was the best means uh, in which to do so. And so he went off uh, and studied uh, philosophy at the Sorbonne and as well as the natural sciences. His main uh, focus uh, was on uh, Spinoza. But while, while he was there, uh, he met uh, his wife, uh, future wife, uh, Reza Olmansov. Uh, she was a Russian uh, Jewish immigrant. And interestingly, uh, not only was she a philosopher and a poet, but her family comes from the city of uh, Mariupol, which is now today Ukraine. And uh, many of you, have, I'm sure, have been following the news rather well and, and understand uh, the situation of the uh, devastation there at Mariupol. Very interesting that her family um, has come from there. Uh, so, you know, they both were very disillusioned uh, about this positivism, the sort of scientific uh, uh, ethos that was uh, pervading the day. And so they were so disenchanted with it um, that they decided to create uh, a suicide pact. And in the memoirs of uh, uh, Reza Martin, uh, she said this about that day as they were walking in the main botanical garden there in, in downtown Paris. She says, we reached a solemn decision which brought us some peace to look sternly in the face, the facts that unhappy and cruel universe wherein the sole light was the philosophy of skepticism and relativism. But if the experiment should not be successful, the solution would be suicide. We wanted to die by a free act if it were impossible to live according to the truth. And so this is the pact that they made, but there were three providential encounters uh, shortly after they made that pact that would completely change the trajectory uh, and influence uh, Maritain's thought for the rest of his life. The first encounter uh, came uh, from uh, a gentleman by the name of Henri Bergson, and it was came via a friend of theirs, Charles uh, Peggy, uh, and he had encouraged them to go and uh, sit down and, and hear the philosophy lectures of, of Brookson's uh, on metaphysics. And this was a decisive uh, uh, intellectual development for Maritain 
because Bergson had opened up this world of metaphysics, something that uh, he didn't see in the world of materialism or in the uh, scientific uh, uh, um, materialist uh, view of the world or uh, in any sort of rationalism and the skepticism, the positivism that was pervading you know, the day. And, and it was Bergson's lectures actually uh, that, that both uh, Reza uh, and Jacques um, influenced them and when they decided to forego their suicide pact and they ended up getting married. So imagine that, uh, that the lectures were so inspirational um, that they ended up getting married. So I want to know if any of you at some point along the way, you know, after this lecture decide to get married, you know, you just let me know and um, might be able to come and be there for it, uh, your wedding. Uh, nevertheless, uh, another uh, introduction that was made was with an eccentric writer by the name of Leon uh, Bluey. Uh, he was, had a radical commitment to Christ, so much so that he lived among the poor there in Paris. Uh, and uh, the Maritimes encounter uh, with Bleu and uh, his lifestyle so inspired them uh, that you know, they decided to be baptized into the Catholic Church. Uh, and Bleu became their godfather uh, as a result of that. So it was another tremendous influence on the Maritimes' life. Um, that was a part of their journey from agnosticism and a, a sense of disenchantment and uh, um, disillusionment with the world in which they lived uh, into becoming uh, a part uh, of the Catholic Church and becoming uh, Christians. A final uh, influence uh, that helped to really solidify uh, Maritain's thought was from a Dominican priest by the name of Father Humbert Clerisac. And he had it uh, was the spiritual advisor of uh, Reza, but it was during a time of, of one of her illnesses that he encouraged her to read the writings of St. Thomas Aquinas. And it was through the reading of Aquinas that Reza shared the same uh, uh, summa uh, with um, Marita or with Jacques. And as a result, this began uh, a process where Jacques became uh, intellectually alive because it was a way in which all these various threads through his days at the Sorbonne, uh, the conversations that uh, he was having with Bergson began to be tied together uh, with his faith uh, as well as with his intellectual uh, pursuits. And it was uh, Aquinas's work um, that would influence him for the rest of his life. And of course, you know, uh, as a result, uh, uh, Maritain had, has made a number of contributions to a number of disciplines, metaphysics, aesthetics, epistemology, anthropology, ethics, social, political thought, philosophy, all kinds of uh, uh, different realms, uh, academic disciplines. Uh, and he's known for his, tom for his tomism and he's known uh, for his another concept called integral humanism. Now, integral humanism is the idea that seeks to bring together the different uh, aspects of the human person. In other words, it doesn't, uh, uh, you know, split uh, the human person into mind and body or mind, body, and soul. Instead, it, all of this is a whole person. All the various aspects of what it means to be human uh, are to be brought together uh, into one. And so it's, uh, um, it also do, uh, uh, emphasized the fact that we shouldn't ignore these various aspects and that they're all are integrated. And so, you know, when um, uh, Maritain wrote about this, one of the things that he said, you know, was that uh, it wasn't uh, an emphasis uh, upon uh, an individual as uh, in sort of more of an American sense of very individualistic. No, he said, while one's private good as an individual uh, is subordinate actually to the common good of the community. And it's the person that has the supernatural end though, it's a spiritual good that's actually superior to society. And so he thought that all political formations of government should be able to honor this idea. And so the individual uh, is important, but yet at the same time should be understood in light of the common good of the community. And yet it's the spiritual good of the human being um, that should be over and superior to society. Uh, 
So that's his idea of integral humanism, and you're going to find it throughout uh, his aesthetics. But it's one of the key influences on the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, and uh, he was a, also a key and instrumental uh, uh, influencer as it relates to the Second Vatican Council. So as I mentioned, uh, this Thomistic uh, influence and in integral humanism, you can see uh, even in his conversations with Rouault as well as uh, uh, Cactor, uh, in some of his major works uh, contributing to the philosophy of art, as I mentioned, were art and scholasticism in 1920, the situation of poetry in 1938, and creative intuition and art and poetry in 53, and the responsibility of the artist in 60. So these are the, the major works. If you're uh, interested in, in reading more about his philosophy of art, these are the ones that I would, I would point you to. So the main idea about his philosophy of art uh, is uh, the idea that art is a habitus of the practical intellect. And today I, I in, will do my very best to pull this apart uh, and help us to understand what this, this phrase means because uh, it's steeped and rooted in, um, you know, Thomistic metaphysics, which has its roots in a, Aristotelian thought as well, uh, as many of you probably well know. And it can get pretty complicated and pretty theoretical and abstract pretty quickly. But I hope that through uh, various examples, I'll be able to um, help it make it a little bit more concrete. And we can obviously discuss more during the question and answer time. But this is his idea. Art is a habitus of the practical intellect. So what does Maritain mean by practical intellect? Well, practical intellect is distinct from the speculative in that the practical concerns itself with the thing which is made. So all right, I'm going to try and see if I can do this here. Um, draw on my screen a little bit. So if you look at it like this, so um, Thomistic thought basically uh, brought down um, the human uh, intellect into two spheres. You had the, the uh, um, speculative and you had the practical. And so the speculative uh, was the idea that it, uh, knowledge was sought for knowledge's sake. That was one side. And the practical, uh, as I mentioned uh, here, is concerned uh, with a thing which is made. Now, there are a couple of different things that can be, uh, be made, but the further distinction from the practical that will follow will be what's between doing um, and making, and then also with then an associated virtue of prudence and then of art. So it's important to, to, to understand this distinction between the speculative and the practical. And you can see there with practical, it's related to doing and making. Doing has to do with human action, uh, has to do with human conduct. And thus, that's why the virtue of prudence is its highest virtue, because prudence helps us to decide what to do at the right time, at the right place. And yet, um, related to the doing-making distinction, making uh, is then with its virtue of art. And that's why um, Maritain focuses uh, um, on the practical side of the intellect, and that art is about making uh, something, uh, a, a work of art, uh, if you will. So let's see if I can clear that. There we go. So it's not a matter then, uh, according to Maritain, about what an artist feels. It's not about the, the inner life per se. The focus is not on the artist, but on the working out of the good and how well something is made, uh, that the artwork uh, is made. And so the art belongs thus to the practical order. Its orientation is towards a doing, a making, not this sort of pure inwardness of knowledge, which is what the speculative um, a side of the intellect is concerned with, is in and that's more deductive reasoning. Uh, and that's the knowledge for knowledge's sake. But if we look at this piece of artwork, which is called Kensuki pottery, it's a Japanese form of uh, art. And if we uh, translate what Kensuki means poetically, it's the idea of a golden joinery. And you can see there how the various fragments of this uh, um, uh, pottery have been rejoined together. And 
I don't know if, if any of you have broken something, a, a pottery, or maybe you've tried to put things back together. I've done it before and, and I've never even thought about trying to put it together with this sort of uh, um, fixing it with, with this gold uh, sort of uh, joints. I always want to try to hide the cracks uh, and try to, to make it seem as if it was never broken. And this Japanese art form, though, is quite the contrary. Uh, instead of trying to hide these uh, uh, fracks, uh, 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 these fractures, and trying to hide these joints, they actually bring them to light um, through this uh, golden uh, um, sort of powder or silver or platinum that's been combined with a tree sap. Uh, and it's often at times said uh, difficult to, to work with. And so when Maritime's talking about the practical intellect and the, the relationship of where art um, falls, it's on this object like this, this Kintsugi pottery. This is where the focus is. The focus is on the making of this particular work of art. So what's the difference then between doing and making? Well, doing fits within the limits of human conduct, as I mentioned before. It in, involves the sort of free exercise of our will, and so it's the good that's directed towards this true end of human life. So that's why prudence, as I mentioned, is its highest virtue. Prudence is that which helps us to make uh, um, the right decisions at the right times in the right places and to know what to do, having to do with human conduct. But making, on the other hand, it's, it's, a, it's a form of doing, but it's productive action. And it has to do and how we use our freedom, but it's in relationship to that which is produced. As I mentioned before, it has to do uh, with the making of, in that case, Kintsugi pottery, this, this artwork. So it's ordered not to the thing that's true end of human life, but what it's ordered to is the good of the artwork itself. In other words, how well is that made, that piece of artwork made? So art is an undeviating determination of the work to be done. Uh, the artist wants to get that right, uh, wants to, to, to create a, a beautiful object. So that's the emphasis here. So if we look at uh, um, this image here of Hannah Hook's uh, art studio, you can see even in, and some of you might know some of her work, uh, an artist uh, uh, well known for her photo montages in her studio, and she's staring here even at a paper trying to uh, figure out how to arrange this particular photo. She's investing uh, the time, the energy, the focus, the determination to get the work done just right. So what does Maritain mean then by habitus? So if, if art is a habitus of the practical intellect, what does Meriton mean by habitus? Well, of course, as if it's not uh, um, complicated enough, um, the word habitus is very difficult to translate, it's very difficult to understand. I mean, it's often confused with the idea of habit or routine. Some even um, have, have gone so far as to say it's about method, but this isn't the case really um, at all. In fact, it's, it's closer to the idea uh, of a disposition, a mindset, perhaps an attitude. It blends, you know, the abilities of an artist with spiritual insights, um, commitment, intuition, selflessness, a sort of unwavering, wholehearted devotion to making good art. And so it's maybe even a, a way to say it, it's, it's, um, it's the environment, the ethos, the milieu in which the artist uh, um, is working. And so how is it attained? You know, how do we come about this habitus? It's, it's attained through careful attention. It's uh, um, attained or uh, uh, obtained through a discipline within tradition. And it's often handed down from an apprentice uh, in an apprentice-like uh, uh, fashion. So Maritain describes it this way. And I'll, we'll read a short quote from him where he says, the presence of such a virtue in the workman is necessary to the goodness of the work, for the manner of the action follows the disposition of the agent, and so are his or her works. For the work in hand to turn out well, there must correspond to it in the soul of the workman such a disposition 
as will produce between them the sort of congruence and intimate proportion which the scholastics termed connaturality. So you can see here that even in this, this quote, you start to look at the various parts, that it's about the disposition, the orientation of the artist uh, in, its, uh, in his or her effort to try to do and make art uh, in such a way that it's done well. So again, uh, if we continue down this road of uh, uh, explaining what habitus is, it does follow a, um, a set of rules per se, but these rules are not um, what you might think of that have been externally imposed. So like you're uh, um, at school or you're in the classroom and the professor tells you, okay, this is what you need to do. Or even in society, the government, you know, uh, prescribes certain uh, laws. Or when we think about driving the rules of the road, this is not at all um, what uh, Meriton has in, in mind. In fact, these rules um, are come out uh, from internally, uh, not only from the artist uh, herself, but also from the medium that's being uh, used, whether it be clay, whether it be paint, whether it be uh, um, um, even uh, music and, and voice and sound. Uh, and so the rules will change depending upon the artist as well as the rule uh, of the medium that's being used. So this habitus or uh, virtue of art that's in the mind of the artist is, is making use of these rules to serve the end of making good art. So these rules are internal, as I mentioned, to the work. They're not external, and they're surely not a particular method. Uh, in fact, Maritime goes on to say in another part of the work on art and scholasticism that if it was a method of some sort, that uh, it's as if art could then be reproducible. And he says this is the furthest thing from the truth. In fact, uh, every work of art is unique in and of itself and cannot be reproduced. So there's always then thus an, an infinite number of ways or an infinity of ways in which an artwork can be beautiful. So what is art according to Maritain? So he says, broadly speaking, art consists not in imitating, like mechanically copying or reproducing, but in objectively making a good work of art out of pre-existing matter that follows the logic. This is what I was, was talking about just a minute ago about the rules of chosen mediums and materiality done not in isolation as if the artist is some uh, uh, um, isolated genius, but in a, a specific community. And it's that community that is in existence at a specific time in a specific place. Uh, in other words, within a specific culture, which shapes this disposition of the artist in a particular a way of being in the world. So if we look at, um, at the church Sacre Coeur there in Paris, you know, Maritain uh, had, had commented about, uh, you know, cathedrals like this and said builders didn't harbor any sort of thesis. Uh, they were men that were unaware of themselves. They neither wished to demonstrate the propriety of Christian dogma, nor to suggest by some artifice a Christian emotion, they even thought a great deal less about making a beautiful work than of doing good work. They were men of faith, and as they were, so they worked. Their work revealed the truth of God, but without doing it intentionally, and because of not doing it intentionally. And so when we get towards the, the end of the, the, the talk here, uh, I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail about what Maritain um, means by a Christian artist. But here, even in this quotation, you can start to see the beginnings uh, of what it would mean to be a Christian artist. So when we think about art, um, sometimes people make distinctions uh, between art and fine art and uh, Meriton does the same thing, uh, a similar thing, but he does so on the basis of a metaphysical concept, uh, transcendental, called, uh, as if you well know, beauty. 
And the transcendentals uh, um, in, consist of uh, unity, truth, goodness, uh, and beauty. And while they're distinct, they're all uh, interrelated uh, as well. But Meriton makes this distinction uh, of beauty as a transcendental being because it serves as a transition for him to go from the broad uh, uh, genu a species of art to more specific uh, idea of art as fine art. So when we were talking about art in general, he had everything in mind that had more practical, practical ends like crafts, uh, craftsmanship, or uh, any sort of uh, making of a cathedral, as I mentioned, or making a ship um, that had uh, um, any sort of practical end uh, in mind. But he makes the distinction with the fine arts, uh, of which includes things like painting, sculpture, music, poetry, dance. Um, these fine arts are about the artwork itself. Um, it has no uh, utilitarian end. It has no use value, uh, so to speak. And the reason why he says it doesn't have that use value, uh, it has, and it's because its end is beauty. Uh, in other words, the artist is making a painting or a sculpture to be enjoyed. Uh, and the reason why it's enjoyed is because it is a part of and participates in the transcendentals, um, namely in this case, beauty. So beauty, what is beauty? Uh, of course, today uh, it's a, a contested term, a term that many people see as relative or subjective and has been dismissed. In fact, many people think that it's profanity in, in the world of art. Um, and yet Maritain argues that it's essential. Uh, beauty delights the perceiving mind through the senses and their intuition. In other words, it's objective. It's outside uh, um, the subject, uh, and it's uh, yet at the same time it has subjective effects, and those effects uh, um, are part of the perceiving mind through the senses and their intuition. So, what does beauty consist of? It consists of integrity, uh, because the mind likes being. It consists of proportion because the mind likes order and unity, and it consists of clarity because the mind likes light and intelligibility. This is a classic uh, Thomistic understanding of beauty, integrity, proportion, and clarity, and it is uh, a, a way in which uh, creates delight and joy. It's a sort of simple act of knowing, uh, um, and yet it's this joy that overflows through the artwork um, into the object and through the object uh, having uh, a subjective effect. So if we think about um, this particular image here, you'll see it's an image uh, um, by Bougereau, uh, the Holy Family. And Maritain uh, looks at this particular uh, work of art and he says the idea of integrity or perfection or, or complete execution can be realized not in one way only, but in a thousand or 10,000 different ways. So just by linking beauty to the fine arts, he's not saying that in prescribing only one way of doing things. In fact, it's, he says in other places that it's infinite, um, that there's a, just numerous different ways, thousands and thousands of different ways to obtain that particular end. And so the lack of a head, he says, or an arm is considerable defect in a woman but of a much less account in a statue. And here he was having uh, Venus de Milo's in, in mind. But then he goes on, he says, the slightest sketch of Leonardo's or even Rodin's is nearer to perfection than the most Finnish uh, Bourgeois. And what's interesting about this comparison he's making through this particular work of art is that he doesn't see Bourgeois as even approaching that sense of beauty, because it's almost as if it's fictitious, it's idealized. Um, in, instead, he thinks that just the sketch of Rodin's, this in this case, the Cambodian dancer, any sort of sketch that doesn't even fully flesh this out, he thinks this in and of itself is nearer to perfection um, because of its proportion and integrity and clarity than Bourgeois, uh, in this case, holy family. 
So I think um, that's an important uh, point that he's making. And hopefully these concrete examples uh, are able to help you um, make some distinctions. So as we move on uh, to, to think a little bit more about the fine arts, the fine arts themselves, they're oriented towards beauty, not to some uh, with that which is to be enjoyed and not some practical end um, to be used, whether it be a, a clock or a watch or a ship uh, um, or a pot. He says the fine arts aim to produce this joy and delight um, through an object that is perceived by the mind's intuition of the senses. It's apprehended, in other words, it's tasted, um, it's seen, it's glimpsed, but it's not necessarily comprehended. In other words, it's not exhausted. Uh, so we see something beautiful, uh, it, it impresses um, that uh, and we enjoy it. it, it comes to a sense of delight and awe, and yet we don't have the whole of it. And so we've been able to taste it, experience it, but it's not exhausted in that experience. And yet at the same time, when we have that sort of realization, it's as if we know there's something more beyond what that experience um, is all about. So beauty in one sense is relative, um, but not relative to the subject, as many want to claim today. Maritime would say that it's relative to the work that's made. The work's delight comes you know, through the artist and the discovery that the artist or the realization of something in the secret depths of being. So as the artist is making and creating, she's doing so in a way that's participating in this deeper sense uh, of reality, this, this being. And the goal of uh, in fine arts uh, is oriented uh, towards beauty, that realization uh, of experience of delight and joy. So there's an infinite number of ways, as I mentioned before, in which a work of art can be beautiful. And it's because of this particularity uh, of which uh, it can be beautiful that many perceive a work's beauty while others do not. And so this explains why, why Mariton thinks that this explains why some people may see one art, uh, 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 work of art as beautiful and other as not because of the, the place and the person who, which created it uh, and the object uh, um, that's created. And so um, it also has to do with the person perceiving the object. Perhaps the person perceiving the object doesn't uh, um, see it because they need uh, um, to be shaped and formed in, in proper ways of seeing um, or attending to the work of art itself. So this particular portrait here um, by Ramon Gomez um, is, I'm sorry, of Ramon Gomez de la Serena uh, is by Diego Rivera in 1915. And when we look at this particular work of art, you know, um, Maritain was describing, uh, you know, our, our walk through the gallery, say you're, you're at the Louvre or perhaps even uh, um, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York or something. And when we're going through the art gallery, you know, we, we leave through and walk through different rooms, he says, and we, we end up leaving this sort of uh, rooms of primitive art, if you will. Uh, and once we leave these primitive arts, uh, um, we enter into these rooms that have all kinds of oil paintings, and there's much more considerable material science going into these particular uh, works of art. And he says, the foot advances over the floor, but the soul sinks into its depths. It had been taking the air of the everlasting hills. It is now on the boards of a theater, a magnificent theater. In the 16th century, deceit installed itself in painting, which began to like science for its own sake and to give the illusion of nature to make us believe that in front of a picture, we were in front of the landscape or the subject painted, not in front of a picture. The great classics from Raphael to Greco, Claude Lorraine and Watteau succeeded in purifying art of such a lie. Realism and, in a sense, Impressionism acquiesced in it. And yet, does Cubism in our day, despite its tremendous deficiencies, represent 
the still stumbling, screaming childhood of an art once more pure. So in essence, what he's trying to say is that cubism perhaps is a way in which to remind us um, that we're actually looking at a painting, that it's not reality itself. Uh, and so he finds some value um, even in the work of the likes here of Rivera. So as I'm coming here towards the end of my, my talk and definitely looking forward to your questions, um, what are some of the things that Mariton has to say about Christian art? Well, he says by Christian art, Mariton doesn't mean that ecclesiastical art, uh, but art that bears the character of Christianity. It's found in, you know, the subject and spirit of the work of art itself. And he describes it as such in this quote, it is the art of humanity redeemed. So wherever art has attained a certain degree of grandeur or purity, it's already Christian. And, and he's referring here, whether it's uh, Egyptian or Hindu or it's Japanese, it doesn't matter where it originates. If it has some sort of grandeur or purity to it, he says, he says, it's already Christian, Christian in hope, because every splendor, spiritual splendor, is a promise and a symbol of the divine harmonies of the gospel. And so those can be found whether or not it's made by an artist who is a Christian or not. And yet he still goes on to say, uh, the reason that such things exist is because God is beautiful. It's beauty that stirs desire and produces love. And yet God's love causes the beauty of what he loves. And whereas our love is caused by the beauty of what we love. And so if you want to produce Christian art, he says, be a Christian and try to make a work of beauty as rare and difficult as that might be and to which you've devoted your heart. It's absurd to try to separate yourself, the artists, from the Christian. They're one, he says. Apply the artist that's in you to the work, and the art will be holy as the one as the other. Quoting Fra Angelico, he says, art demands great tranquility, and to paint the things of Christ, the artist must live with Christ. If you look at this particular illumination uh, on the right-hand side, this uh, um, was done by St. Hildegrand um, back in um, in 1151-52, uh, and it would accompanied a part uh, of her uh, book uh, called Skivas. Uh, it's an illustration of various religious visions that she had, um, and it's one of the first of the three works that she wrote describing her visions, uh, in a title that comes to mean uh, Skiva Vivas Domini, the Know the Ways of the Lord. And so it's a very interesting in, in that it has a sense of abstraction to it, and yet at the same time, um, it has proportion and, and, um, and seems to me a, a, an incredibly beautiful piece of work. So when we think about um, Maritain's idea of what it means uh, to create a work of art, uh, as part of the practical intellect. When we think about his phrase, you know, art is a habitus of the practical intellect. How does this resonate within our contemporary context? Well, frankly, within contemporary art, many would probably say his thought is absurd. Um, and perhaps maybe some of you might think of that. You know, how is it that we can, can, can argue and make these claims um, you know, uh, about what art is? Uh, and, and that even beauty, oh my gosh, how can we even uh, talk about beauty? Well, this is something important to note that this is uh, where Mariton saw the absurdity uh, of the world around him. And you might remember early on in his life, you know, the, the kind of environment in which he lived. And as he looked into um, the, the art world, he saw that the romantic uh, impulses were still present in his own day. In fact, he said, you know, romanticism locates the art within the artist's feelings and experiences as a way to validate the artwork. The emphasis is on the subjective life of the artist. The artist is an isolated genius and creates out of his or her own originality, godlike, limitless, without restraint. 
And this is actually the opposite of what uh, Maritain is arguing for. And in fact, you know, the focus is not to be on the artist and the artist's inner life, though he recognizes fully that that's present as well um, as a part of uh, contributing to a work of art. But instead, the focus and attention should be on the, the uh, uh, work of art itself um, and what is made. So philosophically speaking, he uh, contrasts his own way of thinking with Descartes' what's called cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. And he says it's with Descartes that we have a disconnect where human reason has lost its grasp on being and thus on truth, goodness, and beauty. So when you think about what Descartes saying here, I think, therefore I exist. In other words, the thought and epistemology, and to put this in philosophical terms, uh, epistemology, uh, the study of knowledge, comes prior to metaphysics, um, you know, being. And so in this case, Descartes is saying, I, because I'm able to think, because I'm able to doubt, um, the reasons I doubt, I therefore must exist. Well, Maritain is saying it's actually the opposite. He says, the only reason why you're able to think is because being exists. Being exists, therefore you can think. So theologically, the modern world with its ever-increasing commodification uh, and drive towards efficiencies had promised the artist all things. But yet this habitus, Maritain uh, uh, would say, is what was shaping human beings in a very inhuman way. And as a result, it prevented them from remembering God. And so with these sort of reasons in the background, this is why uh, Maritain uh, it created, you know, his his philosophy of art uh, that was objective, uh, in the sense um, that it was about the object that was made, and yet at the same time, um, the artist, uh, the subject, uh, was creating out of a specific a specific uh, habitus, uh, a, a specific environment, and at a particular place in time. Um, and so this sort of sociocultural milieu was important uh, to the creation and making of art itself. But the focus, of course, um, should be and the accents should be placed on the work of art itself. And of course, um, making the distinction between fine art and the arts more generally uh, came because of uh, fine arts is that to be enjoyed because they are in pursuit of beauty itself. Well, that concludes my talk. I hope you uh, enjoyed it. I look forward to uh, your questions. So thank you very much for the lecture. And uh, do we have any questions right of the bat from any of you? Okay, so if not yet, uh, I have some which have been written in advance. So um, one, so first one is um, um, from one listener and he says, I have read Maritain's statement that modernist art is superior to realist art because allegories and symbols are more suitable for creating beauty than images. So why does Maritain say that allegories and symbols are more suitable for creating beauty? And perhaps you have some examples. Yeah, so, you know, as I understand Maritain, uh, you know, allegory and beauty. So if you think back to the presentation where we looked at Bougereau uh, um, and we're comparing that uh, with Rodin's sketches. Uh, and I think you know, the, the idea of realism um, was to paint in such a way um, that it was idealizing um, the, the human form. Uh, and in this case, you know, uh, what Maritain is after uh, is the idea that sometimes uh, when we're approaching beauty, we're trying to, to get, make something beautiful, uh, um, not only should we not be focusing on that itself, we should just try, try to do a good job uh, at whatever we're making, um, that at times it's better to come at it um, a, in an indirect way. 
Uh, and so by indirectly getting at something, we're able then uh, um, to see what might be difficult to see. Whereas if we are deliberately trying to do something, then we often, you know, uh, get caught up and we can never actually do it. Instead, uh, it's perhaps maybe this more simple example. Um, you know, when you're trying to remember something that you forgot uh, and you're like, oh, I'm trying to remember, I'm trying to remember. And then you actually distract yourself and you go and do something. And then you remember after you're, and you weren't even thinking about it. You weren't even trying to do it. So I think that's in part what he's trying to say. Think about uh, the example I gave about um, um, you know the craftsmen who made the cathedral. They weren't concerned about you know you know their talents. They weren't concerned about themselves. They just wanted to make something good. They wanted to do their job with excellence. They just wanted to pursue it in such a way to the best that they could. And in the process of doing that and focusing on, on creating something good, they ended up making something beautiful. But that's not what they always had in the forefront of their minds. Um, so hopefully that helps a bit. I think the nature that Maritain is saying with regards to the importance of symbolism or metaphor is that sometimes it's uh, easier to get at something that is elusive indirectly rather than pursuing it directly. Um, and again, his contrast between Rodin uh, and Bourgeois is uh, something that, uh, you know, that this was more of a fake art, if you will, um, like fake news. <laughs> so. Thank you. I personally find the example of the builders of the cathedral very inspiring and the concept uh, of uh, the aim to be to be doing only good work, um, not not necessarily, yeah, beautiful. Yeah, I find it very humbling and uh, new, maybe, in today's uh, context. Um, does anyone have any remarks on this question? If you want to share, if not, I can move on to another question because I have some. So. Another question is, is the artist responsible responsible for the effect of his work um, that mm -hmm. it has on people? <laughs> and uh, furthermore, uh, or is it uh, more a relationship between the viewer and the work um, that the artist cannot and does not have to foresee? Yeah, this is a good question uh, in, and complicated as well. Um, because if you, on the one hand, first, I think it's important uh, to understand that, you know, Maritain is not, uh, uh, by his emphasis on the creation of a good work of art, he is not simply uh, uh, um, saying this exclusively, as if this is all that matters, um, that it's only the work that you do this well. Notice that the, in his phrase, uh, um, art is a habitus of the practical intellect, right? So the habitus is that milieu, that environment, that disposition of the artist. So he is recognizing the subjectivity um, that goes into making a good work of art. Uh, and so he also, in, especially when we were looking at, at towards the end about a Christian, uh, what does it mean to be a Christian artist or creating Christian art, was saying, just be a Christian. Uh, you know, follow Christ, live within the community. This is not an individual sport. This is not an individual life. This is one that we should be doing this together. We live together. We work together. We play together. Um, we try to understand life together. We walk this together. And so it's within that environment that shapes who we are. And in making something, we're obviously putting something of ourselves into the work of art itself. So I keep that as backdrop because this is what makes it complicated. Um, when we say then, well, how far is the artist responsible, um, you know, for what that might cause? Well, in in in, um, in one sense, the artist is responsible uh, um, for creating a good work of art. This is the, what he argues in his 1963 work about responsibility of the artist. 
is to make something good, to do it well, to, 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 to focus on your craft, to understand the materials. The materials uh, actually have something to say to us. They have limitations. Um, this was what he meant by the rules. As we start to play with clay or we try to, to do something with the paints or different brush sizes um, or different forms of dance, the ways in which the body moves or can't move, these are rules that govern the way in which the art is made. So focus on the craft, focus on the, you know, working to do the very best. So in that sense, the artist is responsible. And yet at the same time, can it, the artist be responsible for what's received uh, um, on subjectively by the audience, how the audience uses and takes and perceives that um, the, the, the audience is also responsible. So they're responsible uh, um, to how they perceive and receive that art. Um, so I don't know that I'm giving the, an answer that's clear other than to say yes and no. <laughs> I think it's a bit of both. Um, it's like as if you're reading a book, a, a work of literature. Um, the, the, you know, there's a literary a theory out there called reader response theory, uh, meaning that the reader uh, um, can respond by making uh, the work to say whatever he or she wants it to say. Uh, and so this, you know, flows out of a relevant, relativistic understanding of what literature is. However, I would call those kinds of readings irresponsible. Uh, because they're not attending to what is being said uh, by the author. Now, that doesn't mean there's only one way to read something. There could be a variety of different ways to read something, um, whether it's because of context or whether it's because of the uh, um, ability of words to cover multiple different possibilities. So I'm not saying you read something, it's only one way of reading and that's it. No, that's where interpretation comes in. However, I'm also not saying that you can make whatever you want to say, whatever, uh, it doesn't matter. So similarly, the reader is responsible, the audience is responsible, and yet the author is responsible to writing a good work uh, of literature. Thank you. I think it was a, a really good answer um, because, um, yeah, it's a hard question and I'm sure uh, each artist um, uh, has this on uh, this question coming up? Uh, um, let me let me say this in relationship to tomorrow's uh, discussion because we'll look specifically at uh, um, the Cabaret Voltaire and particularly Hugo Bell uh, and uh, the beginnings of uh, Dada, and in, if anything of that movement it was political, um, if anything with this movement it was provocative. <laughs> Uh, if anything about this movement, it was one in which uh, um, strikes at the very heart of that question. So to, well, I, I won't give away tomorrow's uh, discussion, but I think trying to understand and come to grips with what Maritain is saying uh, about the work of an artist uh, um, and then thinking, um, is it possible even to find anything that's good coming out of Zurich? <laughs> You know, or is it all nonsense? Um, will be uh, helpful, perhaps, in in bringing some more light to that question. Yeah, that's good. Looking forward. Okay, so maybe right now someone has something to. Okay, Veruta, go ahead. Uh, not exactly really on this, but maybe I'll, I have a question a little bit connected with uh, the concept of Christian art as Meriton mm -hmm. saw it, and maybe I would like to ask it now, just not to go too far away from it. Yeah. So um, uh, Meriton um, sees that concept of Christian art in a very broad sense, as every example of art that uh, bears the character of Christianity in mm -hmm. subject and spirit, and mm -hmm. uh, he calls it the art of humanity redeemed, or Christian in hope. So um, I was wondering, while listening to you, what, do, uh, what did artists of other religious tradition traditions or who simply did not want to be called Christian artists uh, mm -hmm. said about it. Have you heard any comments? Um, mm. 
So are just so that I understand uh, your question. So um, are you, you're wondering about uh, what has been perhaps the um, uh, secondary response or the reception of this idea of Christian art. Um, this is by non-Christian artists. By non-Christian like, uh, artists, as as at least as I understood, uh, it's uh, um, it's like um, Maritain, um saw uh, uh, like uh, very different types of art, of world art, as possible to understand from that Christian point of view, as the ones that bring uh, the beauty in them, uh, as like Christian and hope. But what yeah. did artists from other religious traditions thought about this idea? Yeah. So um, I'm not. I mean, I know. Uh, I'm sure there are uh, you know any number of responses. Uh, uh, I don't you know no particular one comes to mind. Um, but we can uh, you know surmise and imagine what some of these responses might be, right? And so uh, of course some in uh, who perhaps come out of a strong or uh, a secular position um, would be one at which uh, wants to separate uh, this sort of faith, uh, keep this private, keep it. So there would be one of these sort of responses, uh, generally speaking, uh, um, that could very much, uh, um, you know, press up against Maritain in, in a sense that this is your own personal thing. You keep this out. It's you know, it shouldn't be you know part of the the conversation or the discussion. And you could see a very antagonistic uh, um, response to Maritain. And, and in fact, um, you know, yeah, you, you can find this throughout a lot of current readings about uh, the trajectory of art history. So uh, one example in, in art historical literature is uh, uh, the way in which art history is read. And so um, some who read, uh, uh, you know, the break in art history uh, from the medieval period, they see this as a great, uh, um, you know, novelty um, that as we became more enlightened, that we were making progress, we're getting away from these sort of oppressive traditions, these hierarchical, patriarchal ways of of the living and world, and we're actually becoming more free, right? So you know this narrative. This is throughout art history, um, and this is uh, more of a secular reading. Whereas on the flip side of the same coin, you have Christians that would say, or even religious uh, um, uh, uh, from different religious traditions who say this is terrible that we're on the decline now they got away from these principles and now look at what's happened and this was in part where where i what i would call the decline narrative so from the enlightenment we see this great decline and art is actually going into the abyss right these are two sides of the same coin, um, in my opinion. I don't think either one of them, while they both have some truth to them, um, I don't think either one of them actually is reading it right. That's another conversation. Um, the bit at which perhaps somebody from a, another religious tradition would actually probably resonate well with Meritza, uh, in the sense that uh, you know, perhaps uh, from the Jewish faith, uh, or, or even from, um, you know, Buddhism, because of which that there is a sense that there's something more than this only material world, that materiality is not all there is. Um, another way, um, the sociologist uh, Charles Taylor frames it, he says that um, it is uh, um, uh, the imminent world, that there's more than just this imminent world. So the other, you know, those from other artists from other religious traditions would say, well, yes, of course, um, there is more than just this material world. So there is some resonance there. The distinctions, of course, would be what is more and how do we know this and how are we a part of this? Um, and the Christian faith would then argue um, that we're a part of this through the life and, and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's at which we are able then to be a part of this more, right? And yet at the same time, 
uh, still be present within this world because Christ was present within this world. So I'm not sure I'm getting at your, your question uh, exactly. Um, I think another uh, point at which that's uh, important um, that Maritain would make about, uh, and, I, and I said it a bit within the presentation, is that even if a work of art is made by a non-Christian, somebody who's not, uh, um, you know, a, a part of the church, that they still can make Christian art uh, because of its participation in being itself. In other words, it's a splendor, it's beauty, it's a ability to delight. Um, it's uh, 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 all of these things are ways in which it still can be considered Christian in a broad, broad sense, because it is about being itself. In other words, it's participation in uh, um, being. And so that I think is politically speaking, he did the same thing in, in his uh, uh, contributions to the UN Declaration of Human Rights. Um, he was able then to create a consensus because of this idea of the human person um, and that it's common across a number of different religious traditions um, in that this is where we should join together. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so does anyone have any more questions? Okay, so I'm uh, moving further on the questions given before the lecture. So next question is, what is the purpose of artistic creation according to Maritain? And is it more for God or for reveal revealing the divine to people? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, and so you'll recall what Maritain had said um, so if we, uh, again, want to make two distinctions, um, one between art in general, which would include craftsmanship, right? Um, and art in general uh, would be this broader category. Uh, and so the, it has to do with use. Um, so, you know, somebody who makes a cup or makes a pot or someone who, who makes a, a watch or a clock. Um, all of these things can be considered art in a very general and broad sense, Maritain says. And so in, in that sense, that uh, um, the person who's making the clock should make the best clock possible, um, should do uh, through all the different ways in which the craftsmanship um, that comes in, in the limitations and the rules of the material that's being used to create the clock, whether you're using wood, you know, whether you're using plastic, whether you're using, I mean, any sort of material um, that would be suitable for making a clock, do your very best to make it well. Um, and so, and in doing that, Maritan would say, you're actually honoring God because you're doing it in a way that is pursuing excellence, that doing it well. And that in and of itself is enough. Um, now, the distinction he makes with fine art the goal then of fine art is not only to do something well, to, to paint well, um, but it's also to make a work that's beautiful um, without thinking about you, that's what you're doing. Um, and so the focus is still the same. The focus is still the same on making a good work of art, but uh, by doing it well, by working hard, by throwing your whole life into it, by throwing your whole body into it, by throwing your whole soul, mind, all of that into your work. Um, and so it completely is consuming. But yet in doing it that way, your goal and aim is uh, um, to create something that's enjoyed, that's delighted in. Um, and this enjoyment and joy and delight um, is, is then, of course, connected with God himself, um, as he said that, you know, uh, God is beauty. Um, and so as Christian artists, um, that would be, uh, um, I think, a distinction that he would make, both of which are bringing honor and glory to God, but in two different ways, two distinct ways, with thousands and thousands of ways to get there. <laughs> 
there's no just one way. There's no just one way. There's a multitude of different ways um, based on material, practice, tradition, individual artists who's located in a culture, a specific time, a specific, I mean, then you can see um, how all this starts to um, open up a variety of possibilities. And I think in the ways in which artists pursue that, then are honoring God, um, are pleasing to God. Um, and so, you know, the artists not making the work about themselves, but making it about the artwork itself. Um, and that resonates, you know, well with, you know, other parts of things we see in, in the Bible, right? And scriptures that, you know, that talk about, you know, uh, Jesus's life, about denying yourself, taking up your cross, following me, right? He talks also in other places, uh, Paul in his own letters, uh, you know, Jesus, uh, you know, who denied himself, you know, gave up his own glory as God himself and became a human being, right? This is about humility. So I think this is where this idea of the, the, the humility of the artist would come in from a Christian perspective. Yeah, that's very beautiful. The humility, the idea of humility, it's, it's very refreshing, I would say. Nice. Yeah, and I think this is in part what, you know, what Maritan, you know, felt uh, in what he saw and experienced in his own day, um, because Maritan was, you know, disillusioned with the scientific materialism that he saw, uh, and the romantic idea that the artist is a genius, isolated, who comes up with these brilliant ideas, just boom, like a flash of lightning, and Maritain saying quite the contrary. It actually takes hard work. In fact, another part in his, in the latter parts of the book on art and scholasticism, he says, being a, a, a Christian artist is difficult, doubly difficult, and not difficult by adding two plus two, but actually multiplying them together because it's already hard, one, to be an artist. And it's then hard too to be a Christian. Uh, and he says both of these two things together make it infinitely hard to then uh, um, be a Christian artist. And then it's rare that a work of beauty is created. So what are we to do? <laughs> well, we're to do our very best. We're to be humble. We're to work with the materials we have. We're to be in community together being, uh, um, you know, learning what it means to follow Christ, to do, uh, to be a Christian, and yet at the same time, learn our craft well, learn the materials well. Uh, materials, you know, speak. Um, there's uh, I, another side conversation would be, there's a, a new, uh, called new materialism, and it's built off, um, uh, on the one hand, it's built off a of former Marxist thought, um, and one of the things that new materialists, you know, they focus on the materiality of things, and there are things in there that we'd want to reject, but at the same time, there are things uh, within this movement that are important because they talk about the uh, the fact that that uh, creation, or, well, they wouldn't form it as creation, but the material speaks, um, and so you know, matter has something to say to us, and we need to listen. And I think this, not an, being an artist myself, um, but uh, understanding and talking with artists, um, this is something that they know intuitively. Um, they know that the material they use speaks to them because it, it uh, allows them to open new ways of seeing um, or it limits them in how they do things. And so uh, it's important, I think, to listen to the material. Yeah, well, we have some artists here with us today. So I think um, like some of the people that we hear exactly what you say and I personally yeah to some degree and uh, but also I think that uh, what you said about uh, being a Christian artist is uh, uh, two and two times difficult and in in another side 
uh, when compared to that genius artist who comes up with his genius ideas out of nowhere, it takes the pressure off, I think, because um, I don't know uh, how others feel, but uh, I have um, encountered a feeling uh, during my studies that I have to be this genius artist. I have mm -hmm. to get these genius ideas, you know, because, well, then who am I? I'm nobody, you know? So it definitely is um, a, a way forward. And yeah, I, I totally, totally see the point, so. Yeah, I think it's what the, the irony of uh, trying to pursue this idea of artist as genius, we'll just use this as a phrase of this whole idea, romantic notion, um, you know, keep, keep in mind that that, you know, too, is a reaction to what happened during the Enlightenment, um, this sort of cold calculating sort of rational approach to life. Um, so this keep just keep that those reactions in mind. So this sort of artist as genius, you know, it's actually ironically uh, creates a, a deep, deep sense of insecurity, <laughs> right? Um, in a sense that how could I ever live up to something like this? And so you end up feeling that you're worthless, um, that you're just like, there's no way that I could ever do this. This is ridiculous. Um, and so it, it, it creates all kinds of senses of doubt um, within yourself. It's, a, it's the irony that I see there that is actually debilitating, taking you away from your vocation. So as, uh, whereas the Christian idea that Maritime is arguing for is one uh, that takes the focus off yourself um um in one that's uh, of a humble location and place um focus in on doing your craft well doing your work well um and of course being um you know a christian well yeah katrina what do you think <laughs> Because uh, I, I just said that because, uh, well, me and Katrina have had these discussions, you know, about oh, speaking uh, the impossible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ruta, you may, you may ask. Yes, good evening. Um, thank you very much, uh, Stefan, for your presentation. And I would like to ask, I, I as well, I, I studied a, a little bit, Maritan, and um, I, I just want to ask you if, um, what do you think? Uh, because he influenced a lot of um, uh, Pope Paul VI and mm -hmm. um, Dominicans, mm -hmm. especially, you know, and uh, I think that, um, that he, um, was really recognized in really small um, intellectual um, uh, group and as well influenced as well, not a lot of people because it is, uh, this thinking is, um, is really, um, as well what you are speaking, it's really um, transcendental, a little bit too difficult and too uh, wide, no, it's too much wide and too much to say that doing good. So what is doing good, you know, it is, I know what uh, Maritan is saying about this, but I think that the reflection or rec uh, the recognition of this uh, thinking was not really um, huge for this reason. And I just wanted, um, I, I, I mean, it is too much specific and too much high, you know, and it's not, um, um, yes. And um, I, I, I just wanted to ask, what do you think about nowadays artists? And do you know anybody, you know, because it's too much far away from reality. Uh, I mean, really, I, I know that it is really understandable, but on the same time, especially in the church, you know, in the, in, the, in the context of the church, it is really absolutely rejected, this thinking. Yeah, it is. We, we need to say this, but this is reality. And, you know, we can speak about this, that it, it could be accepted, but actually it is not. 
And it was not accepted as well in his time, I think. It was accepted in the small group. And, uh, and uh, I just, you know, that's why I a little bit asked uh, about Pope. Of course, Pope has, uh, uh, yes, his period and, and that ended, you know, uh, after him, with what he created. And um, so I just wanted to ask, what do you think, you know, about nowadays? About mm -hmm. nowadays artists, if, if do you find uh, can you find any artist who um, recognized in this thinking himself, or um, or do you think that this is theory and nobody is uh, seeking for this? You know, now we are speaking in the group who uh, I am PhD student and uh, and I'm art histo historian and theoretical, but. Um, this, this is a group especially of artists. So it is very important to understand uh, what do you think about this um, connection between what is really um, artists uh, context of nowadays? Yeah, that's what a great, that? yeah, great mm -hmm. question. Um, and a lot of different threads there. I'll need to ask you uh, a question about your understanding of um, how you think artist or art is received within the church. Uh, so think about that, uh, hold on to that, because the way in which that may be perceived in Lithuania um, is definitely going to be different than the way it's received in the United States uh, and in even different parts of the United States. So uh, the, be that as it may, so think about, uh, I'm curious to hear more about uh, um, Lithuania and what you, you know, how uh, artists are received, because it's my impression from my experience in being there that artists actually are quite well respected in Lithuania, that they have a, a, a place that, uh, you know, the arts are valued maybe not necessarily individual artists, but at least traditionally, historically, uh, um, Lithuania has great respect for the arts. Um, in the church in the United States, particularly uh, um, in, in some more conservative elements in the United States, uh, yeah, in, in Protestant circles, um, the arts are completely tomfoolery that's rejected, it's uh, foolish to even participate in this pagan exercise, literally. So as a that's a hold on to that thought. Um, but let me address what you said earlier about Maritan being abstract, um, very high, not connected with the way things are happening for real artists. Um, I can see where you're coming from, uh, particularly because, you know, philosophically speaking, uh, he is wrestling with uh, you know, uh, Thomistic metaphysics. Anytime you deal with this side of um, who talks about, who talks like this, right? Who talks about being, who talks about, you know, these sort of, we may talk about beauty, but we think it's a, some sort of um, word that's a, a, a cuss word, right? Beauty, oh, I shouldn't say that, right? Uh, although I would say that it's actually in some circles is coming back into play. Um, there's a couple of New York Times articles that came out about this in their arts and culture section. Um, you could simply Google beauty in New York Times and you could find these articles. Um, so, yes. So I understand where you're coming from. Um, and this is the sort of deep philosophy of which he's exposing us to. And yet, I think it's important, uh, um, and of course, I'm arguing here for my discipline, um, to wrestle with some of these things, because whether you talk about materialism, whether you talk about relativism, whether you talk about skepticism, whether you talk about any of these philosophies of the day, um, this postmodern thought um, about uh, you know, critical theory, all of them have assumed a certain view of the world, a certain view of reality. Now it's hidden, it's buried, it's not discussed, it's even denied. No, I don't have a metaphysics. Metaphysics is oppressive. Uh, these meta narratives, these overarching stories that talk about the way uh, reality is, they don't exist. Well, even in those claims uh, of non existence of these things, they're making a claim. <laughs> and so they're assuming certain views of the world. 
So it's important for us to wrestle with this because uh, um, we need to be aware that we uh, uh, make these assumptions. And so to connect these assumptions about what we think about reality um, with the way we live, with the way we practice our art, with the way um, that we treat other people, all of these things are rooted in that. So yes, it can be abstract, but it's important to try to make these connections more clear. Um, and that's what I think, um, you know, these sorts of groups and conversations, you're not going to get it in one reading of Maritan. You're going to have to read him a few times, um, you, you know, or others like him. And, and talk, not by yourself, talking in a group about it. Um, so that that's one thing. I think Maritan actually is quite practical. Um, it can be very concrete, though he is abstract and his thinking can seem elevated or high and not connecting. And here's where it is. It's in his focus on the making, his emphasis on making the art. And so when you think about, yes, I spoke generally about making, but think, let's get specific. Think about a sculptor. When she's working with, with certain uh, materials, clay, certain kinds of clay, think about the Katsugi pottery I, I showed at the beginning. And the, the, they use tree sap and gold and some silver and uh, dust and platinum mixed together with this to, 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 to bring these joints together. Think about the practice of what that would be. So Maritan is saying, do that well. In other words, do your very best. Well, how do you do your very best? You learn from somebody who's already done it. That's this sort of apprentice relationship, um, a teacher-student relationship. And so you're learning uh, from somebody who has a lot of experience. And so this is another very practical thing. Um, is to, to, to start to learn your trade, your craft, the process, how these different materials react under certain conditions. I mean, this seems to me very practical, very concrete, uh, though I'm speaking generally about it. Um, I think if you were to press in, those of you who are artists and work in, in, in different material, you can speak very specifically about that. Um, so I think, I think, you know, as far as today, well, let me give you an example. Um, do you know the Japanese painter Mako Fujimara? Have anybody heard of him before? Um, I'll, let me share my screen and I will show you uh, some of his either, um, abstract artists. This is his website. Um, and he paints on on grand scales i mean it's 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 uh, this one is particular is called walking on water he's a christian artist and his recent book that's come out called art um, plus faith um, he draws heavily upon maritan in fact a lot of his thinking that shaped him as an artist um, is from maritan so um i mean i, I you can play this video here about Nihonga uh, and his approach uh, to slow art. And so this is a particular tradition in which how he makes art um, and how he was learned it from uh, as an apprentice himself. Um, so I, yeah, I would just encourage you to go and look at um, his website. Um, he is a, a, he lives outside of Princeton, New Jersey. Um, here's some other works of his that you can see. Um, let's see here. So I, yeah, yeah, here. This, as like I said, he's an abstract um, expressionist. So, so like I said, he's a he's a he's a concrete example. In fact, I can let me. I'll put it into the chat. Um, his website, and you can go you know, right, um, right to it. Um, so he would be um, one example. Um, uh, you know, of course, you know, being back in the United States, uh, my, um, there's, and he draws upon Maritan, so it's in the chat. The other place that uh, an organization um, that I'm a part of here in the States, 
um, is called Christian in the Visual Arts, Christians in the Visual Arts. And I'll put their website uh, also um, in um, the chat. And this organization as well called SIVA, Christians in the Visual Arts, we discuss these things all the time. So I'm uh, the same kind of conversations we're having here, the same questions you're asking, we're asking the same ones. <laughs> so we're all wrestling with this. And so I went to a conference earlier in the year down in Austin, uh, Texas, um, and I had a great experience talking with artists and same sign, kind of questions. And many of them draw upon Maritan um, and his view of art. I'm also in a reading group with artists uh, locally as a part of my own church. Um, I attend a church uh, called Church of the Incarnation. It's an Episcopal church. And so we're having same conversations. Uh, we just read uh, Mako's book. We read Maritan. Uh, we read uh, different, different books like this. So I think it is happening. Um, I think these conversations and readings take place. Um, and how does it inform your practice? I think it informs your practice in terms of understanding um, this sort of habitus. That's where I think it influences is this habitus that Meriton talks about, this environment in which you're working. Um, and then I think his thought encourages you to do your craft well in a concrete sense. So Ruta, let me come back to you and ask you this. Uh, tell me about um, how, um, you know, your, your point about uh, um, the church and how these things are just rejected. Um, tell me, tell me a little bit more about this. Oh, I mean, um, in that period as well, you, you know, I, I lived as well in Italy eight years, so in Rome especially, so I, as well, you know, um, last time I, I passed in, in Italy, but uh, uh, not here in Lithuania. And, um, but I mean uh, that in that period, you know, the problem of what is sacred and religious, and uh, in that period was uh, really discussed. And mm -hmm. of course uh, it is, um, you know, good cases of Matisse uh, or, or, or chapel and so on, but as well the context of Dominicans. And, um, um, you know, I'm just um, wondering how it can be that this art which you have cho um, chosen to show us uh, could be inserted in the church. You know, I mean that, um, you know, it is too, uh, discourses of the artists who are doing and as well how the church accept this art mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, you know that uh, you know when we are speaking about uh, about uh, catholic you know context mm -hmm. of church mm -hmm. I, I i am from catholic and majority i i i think are from from catholic context and uh, and then you need to decide if this artwork, you know, it is, it could be or not could be in the church. There is really, no, I don't know about others who are wondering when we are speaking about this uh, Christian art in generic discourses, but uh, always um, I know that with Maritan was this problem, you know, that um, to, to, you know, to, I don't know, what about the Trinity? What is, uh, the um, subject, some subjects, concrete um, Christian subjects. Um, and, uh, you know, as you said, this genius happens really rare, you know, and uh, so, and it's really, um, you know, uh, the church context, usually they not accept this um, waiting for genius or, you know, to, um, to make this, uh, they are not able even to make this discernment. They are, don't want to make this discernment, which are could be or not could be. And even if we are weak, uh, looking for genius, it is really complicated, uh, you know? This mm -hmm. everything, what is, um, I, I, I suppose that I, I love Martin, you know, I, I really, but I suppose that this is a really, um, complicated in the reality you know it yes. is uh, um it is because uh, you know if you could uh, 
you know, this uh, about the, the figurative or abstract art, you know, mm -hmm. it's really important as well, because it's mm -hmm. another uh, world when the church accept or not, if you mm -hmm. can understand in one color that mm -hmm. this is the um, descent of the Holy Spirit, you know, I don't mm -hmm. know. If we, mm -hmm. we speak about Barnett Newman, you know, mm -hmm. when our church will understand this, you know, mm -hmm. when. So, mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to bring, you know, more to the context of our reality of the church and, mm -hmm. and how it is. Um, so that's why I asked a little bit, uh, because, you know, abstract art in church, I never seen in Lithuania, mm -hmm. in, in Italy, mm -hmm. I seen, but um, it's really uh, complicated, I think, how to understand this. So, yes. yeah, I think you're right. Uh, it's, I think it is very complicated, and it's also something that is very contextual. Um, you know, so it, it's, it, I think it requires a great virtue, uh, namely patience. Um, and so, as uh, uh, those of us working within the art world, uh, you know, we, you know, have to be patient with those with whom we, you know, attend church with. Uh, we must be patient with those who might see things differently um, uh, with regards to certain works of art. So that means that we uh, in the art world have to be able to understand, uh, I think, you know, what then can we look at some of these, you know, how do we look at abstract art as Christians? Is it a way in which we can see these uh, um, uh, in which that they communicate uh, um, those uh, uh, that touches on those things that are true, that are good, that are beautiful, that perhaps even um, uh, may seem absurd to uh, people within the church? And this is what tomorrow, so another, another uh, plug for tomorrow, and when we think about Dada, which is one of the most absurd, uh, provocative movements that and people, you know, are going to say about, is there a way that we can look at this movement and say there is something that might be distinctively Christian about it? Um, and if there is, how are we able to identify that? And how do we then communicate that? Uh, um, and so I, I think it comes down, you know, to understanding the faith. Uh, we have to understand our own faith. We have to understand, you know, the, uh, uh, the scriptures. We have to understand the tradition. Um, so these things are important. This is what Maritime was talking about, about be a Christian, um, live in community. And then I also think we have to know um, the art world, whether you're an artist or an art historian or a philosopher of art, a theologian of art, you have to, you got to know your, your discipline well. Um, because then you have to try to make these bridges um, happen. And how do we make these bridges? Bridges take time, um, which require patience and understanding. Uh, so we have to listen well, um, because maybe the, the, the parishioners with whom we live, they're not very attuned to the art world. So that means their seeing, their attention is, is not attuned or focused or developed uh, in a way to see so as from those in the art world, we want to help them to see these things. How do we do that? It takes patience. We have, as I said, all those things, having more conversations like this, um, um, reading, you know, broadly, widely different perspectives on, on this question. I'm just giving you Maritan because 40 minutes to say one thing about a whole range of things would be difficult, so impossible. There are others, Balthazar, one of the main persons I've studied, he has a lot to say about this. Um, you know, there's there's a number of different characters, so. Have you studied Romano Guardini once? He's another one. I have not, but he, I've read uh, about him. He is, his, you know, would be another I, one. So, he, yeah. he is my leader, so I'm studying okay. him. So excellent, know. yeah, excellent. So. Yeah, mm -hmm. Balthazar wrote uh, about Guardini, um, and he has a great uh, appreciation for him. So, yeah, there's a number within the Catholic tradition that has uh, um, intellectual tradition that has great um, love and respect for artists. So, 
But and I think, think oh, mm -hmm. oh, I was just one thing I was going to say. So if we know, for example, about Guardini or, um, you know, and there are others uh, um, that if we live with them, read them, study them, talk about them, they're within the tradition, then we can point people to them. Um, you know, create a reading group within your parish, within your, your congregation, within your church, and say, are you interested in, in learning about art and how it connects with the Christian life and the Christian faith? Let's read this book together. Let's read this uh, essay together. And then you can have these conversations, and maybe that's a way to open up some of that within the church itself, particularly in Lithuania. Okay, so thank you so much uh, for your questions, Ruta. They're very, very interesting. And I think everyone has gathered many thoughts and many uh, realizations. And thank you, Professor, for giving us the links and um, yeah, the, the names. They're very, they're are written down and I, I'm sure will be of use. So, uh, but I would just like to say that uh, we have come to an end of our part one lecture because the time is running out. So I want to once again, thank everyone for participating and uh, professor for the lecture um, and for the questions uh, of, from, uh, of you. And um, um, yeah, so I just want to remind that tomorrow we meet again on the same link on the Zoom platform, 8 p.m. in Lithuania and uh, we will having the part two lecture. And uh, the part two lecture you know, will challenge the contemporary narrative associated with Dada and um, uh, how it might resonate with uh, Maritan and Christian understanding of art. So that, that's it for me. So thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Hope to see you yeah. tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Thank Good you. night, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank Thank you.